my generic statement is that, you know, I believe every occasion, every actual event has four quadrants, four dimensions, and, and relationship is indelible. In other words, I think it's an intrinsic part of every occasion that's arising. And so if you're not actually in touch with the relational aspect of that moment, then you're not really in touch with the whole moment. And so relationship is, in my opinion, absolutely crucial. Yes, yes. And what you, what you want to do is not ignore it or overemphasize it. Either way can, can get you in trouble. Men tend to ignore it. Women tend to overemphasize it. <laughs> but that's what they do for each other. And so that's why, at least on the uh, romantic or sexual or boy-girl relationship, I have to think that's a fundamental unit of practice. And I think that's what Tonka is all about. And I think that's why in the Tibetan tradition, the very highest icons are men and women in sexual commerce. Mm -hmm. Many of those traditions um, maintain that actually without taking an action consort, I mean, without actually going through sexual consummation with a love partner, that there are certain final transformative states of enlightenment that you cannot get into. Now, interestingly, one of the schools of Tibetan Buddhism, founded by um, Tsongkhapa, which is the one that the Dalai Lama is in, they maintain, as do most of the Tibetan schools, <laughs> that there are two ways you can get, and only two ways, you can get absolute ultimate enlightenment. And one is, at the final stage of practice, you have to do tantric sexual practice. Mm. The other is, you can get it in the bardo. Mm. <sighs> Tsongkhapa was so worried about misusing a sexual relationship that he chose to wait to get his enlightenment in the bardo. Now, I'm just wondering about that choice. <laughs> because I don't know if I would have that much uh, confidence that I could pull it off. <laughs> but I'm sure, for sure, I could probably do a lot better. So, um, it's an interesting notion that, that that is actually part of an understanding of the tradition set. I'll tell you why I think that's an important part. Uh, if you, and again, you don't want to pigeonhole men and women, obviously, it, 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 this conversation always has to have the preface saying that we're talking about masculine and feminine principles, and men and women have both of those to various degrees. Um, <clears throat> and the same in lesbian and homosexual relationship, you sort of pick whether you're the more active or, or receptive pole. If you look, we were talking about witnessing. If you look at the traditional descriptions of witnessing, if you also look at sort of um, some of the modern research that's been done on it with people that are attuned to this, when men get into, it's easier for men to get into a state of witnessing because it's a distancing. What women tend to experience that state as more is a state of all radiating love or touch. And there's probably a whole lot of reasons for that going back even to evolutionary psychology. Um, and I know it's trite to say men were hunters and women were child raised life, but it was true. Mm -hmm. For about a million years, what, what men, the type of knowledge that kept survival going is men are in hunting bands, they're hunting at a distance and they're watching at a distance. Mm -hmm. The advantage of third person watching at a distance is you can see holes. Mm -hmm. So it's only from a distance that you can see a forest. Mm -hmm. Okay. You can, only, you can touch a tree, but you can only see a forest. So you need a distance to see holes, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. the women, on the other hand, primary job is tactile. There's an infant, and you have to know every emotional nuance of that infant if you're going to keep it alive. Is it hungry? Is it sad? Is it in pain? Is it so on? Mm -hmm. So women have developed an exquisite emotional scale of just, you know, they can tell 28 degrees of emotional shifts. Men can tell too. <laughs> and with women, it's she wants to sleep with me or she doesn't. <laughs> and they interpret most of the things women say, she wants to sleep with me. <laughs> Get off me, you pig. Maybe she does me. That's, that's about it. So, so with that tactile, both of them have their strengths and weaknesses. Feminists are, are, are fond of saying that women have a relational mode 
and men have an abstract. That's, that, that's only half right. Women have a touch, a tactile relational mode, but it's not holistic. So in other words, you can touch the tree, mm -hmm. but not the forest. So men actually have a holistic, but detached view, mm -hmm. but it's holistic. Mm -hmm. Women have a relational up-touch view, but mm -hmm. it's not holistic. When you're touching one tree at a time, you can't see the forest. That's the strengths and the weaknesses of men and women, and I think that really is what they bring to each other. And that's why we drive each other nuts. Yeah. 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 But it's wonderful being able to sort of uh, understand the differences in language, because at the very least, if you can't really intrinsically feel these differences, you can at least sort of cognitively translate. So, you know, you go, okay, she said that, which really means <laughs> dictionary all of it. <laughs> but instead of, you know, classically what tends to happen is, is if you think you're talking the same language, you want the same things, then you really do get into trouble all the time. And, and the studies on this are absolutely classic. Um, if you're working on problem solving, for example, women will get together if, they, if, they, if there's something's wrong, and they want to just touch, they want to talk about it. A man, if he's present, will fix it. He'll go, well, that's a problem. Oh, okay, well, we'll just look over here and fix it. And women go, no, 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 no. Because if they actually come up with a solution, then it means the conversation is over. There's no more touching. And so they're very clever studies showing that if you actually put a problem on a table that women and just women are supposed to solve, they want to discuss it for an hour or so. Yeah. And if the, if, the, if the solution actually comes up, women will suddenly steer around. Because <laughs> that means the end of the party. And so, so men, though, they're kind of sitting there and say, oh, do that. In the discussion, what's that? Let's go have a drink, you know. <laughs> so it, it's classically when you see this. The worst thing of all is when you're in a relationship and a problem comes up. <clears throat> it's you know I'm not getting enough attention, or we need to do this, or or why aren't we going to the movie tonight, or can't we just be here? And a man will in 15 seconds come up with a perfect solution to it. <laughs> That is exactly the wrong thing to do. <laughs> and, and so, you know, everybody, we could go on and on and on. It's a comedy of errors that is just, you know, infinite. And, and, but uh, it's very interesting when you carry this into the transcendental, transpersonal realms. And, and I think it's increasingly important that this kind of understanding come to uh, our approach to spirituality because, frankly, most of the meditative systems were developed by men sitting and staring. Mm -hmm. And they don't move and they stare and that's what we're good at. Not too many <laughs> systems have been developed for women who want to feel and flow and be radiant and move. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately you get somebody like the only place you get that in men often is somebody like Rumi, who's homosexual. <laughs> <laughs> so of course he's gonna dance and flow and you know that's the great thing. Even in the traditions, though, there's that understanding. If you see uh, the traditional talk, I have several of them here, the Dzogchen, Samadhibhadra, or Samadhibhadri, which represents the highest icon in all of Buddhism. It's the highest icon in Dzogchen Buddhism. And the male is represented as pure black, usually. And that means this pure emptiness, this pure unmoved witness. It doesn't have any content. We were pointing it out just a little minute ago. And everything arises in its vast black emptiness, like the vast star, the vast sky at night in which stars arise. But the woman is always depicted as pure white radiant light. Because the woman, the feminine principle, the man wants to look, the feminine wants to be seen, wants to, wants to radiate, wants to shine. And so if you have spiritual traditions where the woman is forced to look and just not move, it, it can be very difficult for her to come to that part of her that wants to be seen, that wants to radiate, that wants to move, that wants to flow, and most of all, that wants to touch. And so when you get into some of these higher states, classically men will still want to witness, and they'll experience it as emptiness. Women experience it as love, as an actual touching everything out there. So men have this kind of mirror mind, and the feminine principle has the universe is chocolate. <laughs> and it's like, you can taste it, you know. So again, men and women have both of these, and at the ultimate, they really do, they really kind of collapse into each other. 
Um, then there's a compassionate witness. The witness touches everything that's arising. The masculine and feminine forms come together. The woman has to find some distance from her touching or else she has no freedom. She's addicted to her relationship. And that's the classic pathology of female, is that they can't stand up. They can't have autonomy. They're lost in their relationship. And that can, that's what that, you know, that's the downside of that. The classic male pathologies, they're not just autonomous, they're rigid, repressed, separated, can't feel. So it's way too extreme in that direction. And again, ideally what we do for each other is try to balance those. And again, we, you know, we wanna, we come from a period where we sort of, some of these distinctions were really rigid and stereotyped and, and, and under those circumstances, it just becomes harsh. Yeah. But we went way too far and said, okay, no differences, everything's the same, you know, we can't have any of that at all. And that's just as violent in its own way. Mm -hmm. and, and we even have native understanding. I mean, men tend to be appreciated for their capacity for depth and presence, for example. Often one of the most, most the highest compliments you'll give a woman is, she came in the room and she lit up the room. There's a radiance, there's a shine that can come off the feminine. I think that's why it's always depicted as this luminous. And so, the, but the whole point about that we have both of those in us, but each moment is a moment of consciousness and light. And the consciousness is the empty, masculine, black space in which this arises. But the light, the luminosity, is what's dancing, is what you see. Mm -hmm. here. And so each moment of our existence is this union of consciousness and light. And that's relationship in its ultimate sense. Mm -hmm. And that's what's so great about it. Mm -hmm.